Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. My name is Justin. I'm the worship and communications pastor here, and I'm with... Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm yeah. with Duffy Robbins. Yeah. Uh, who just finished part one of a, a new two-part series on Ephesians. Thanks for being here, Duffy. Yeah, my pleasure. Always fun. Come back. Faith Bridge. Thank you. So what are, tell us, what are we walking away from today? What are the, so we're asked to work, what are we saying? Yeah, well, There's first three B's, all, an H, and two S's. Right? There you go. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Easy to remember. Um, I just can't remember what it was, but no, the, the um, well, I think Probably the the, um, the big ideas this week are, first of all, that in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, we're talking about the armor of God. And so the first thing I want people to walk away with is the idea that that we really do have a, this is not a play fight, that we really do have a an enemy. Um, on the other hand, I don't want us to overreact to that and be like, oh my gosh, uh, the, the demons are everywhere. I don't want to leave the house. I got to pray whether I have Cheerios or Raisin Bran because the enemy might be deceiving me. And uh, because then you can't, you'd just be afraid to do right. anything, be paralyzed. So, so it's really, a, um, that's, that's the first thing. We do have an enemy that is real and, and that we need to take him seriously. And then secondly, that because he is a deceiver, to use Jesus' words in John 8, the father of lies, one of the first pieces of armor that we put on is the belt of truth. Right. Because what, what better, what more appropriate weaponry when you're facing a deceiver than truth. And then um, secondly, to talk about righteousness, which protects the heart. So those are kind of the three big things I wanted to say. Well, so you talked about uh, the Satan and the deception. I think that came across really well, some really touching illustrations. What, what, are, what are some of his strategies on uh, deceiving us? Well, um, well, first thing, all, Satan can't create anything. All he can do is pervert God's good creations. Yeah. So. Um, so he takes God's good gifts and, um, and he perverts them. So, you know, he takes, I mean, sexuality is a great example. He takes the gift of sexuality and he perverts it. So, that, so it's not a matter of God going, no, sex is bad. Sex is good, but Satan perverts it and he makes it into something bad. Um, one of the ways it's easy to, uh, to talk about it, if you're, if you're watching and you want to kind of explain this to your children, uh, one way to kind of think about it is, you, is that, that God is the giver of life, that he wants us to live life abundantly. And so you just spell out the word li uh, live, L-I-V-E. That's God's gift. Satan perverts that. And if you pervert the word live, it's E-V-I-L. Do you know that? Yeah. That's evil. So, Sorry, so I, wasn't, it, I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. That's what I was afraid of. I noticed your mind wandering. But, um, but yeah, so that... that that, um, that's kind of a, a, a metaphor of the way Satan operates. He takes God's good gifts and perverts them, you know, either by, either by making it seem, you know, distorting it, making it bigger than it should be, or making something good smaller than it should be. Um, but yeah, that, that I think is the basic strategy. Satan can't create anything, but he can pervert God's good gifts. That's good. Um, moving on to the belt of truth. Belt of truth, yeah. I think we all know, we believe that there are certain fundamental truths. When I drop this, let go of this pin, it's going to drop. Mm -hmm. I know that gravity yeah. is a truth. Mm -hmm. What are the other ways? I also know there must be truths, and, and you can ask that and say, well, the Bible. What are ways yeah. we can discern real truths? Right. Well, in fact, you don't really know the pen will drop. You think it will because it has every other time you've dropped it. But we don't know. It could be that there's a law of gravity that, that every, you know, gazillionth, you know, time somebody, then gravity doesn't work. So, so even the things we think we know, we don't. Hmm. We don't know, um, you know, with absolute, you know, with absolute clarity. Um, but, but, uh, we, how do we do truth? I mean, the um, and you just this is an important question. I mean, like it, you know, some of our uh, some of the people who are tuning in, you know, will be familiar with the word epistemology, uh, which means how do we know what we know? Epistemology sounds like the study of anger. 
Uh, but uh, but actually, Wait, how, how do you spell <laughs> <Wait a minute. laughs> it? But uh, but but basically, it's yeah. How do I know? It comes from pistuo. How do I know what I know? And here's the problem: is that I I realize that my perceptions are distorted by my background, um, and so that that causes me sometimes to be suspicious of my you know what I believe to be true, and it caused me to be suspicious of what. You be true because I know for that, that distortion is true for me. It's true for you. That's one of the reasons why in the church, we um, really need to embrace not just scripture, although that's important. We need to also embrace the tradition of the church, because that is two thousand years of our brothers and sisters in Christ, who also have been led by the Spirit, um, and 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 the creeds come to us as sort of an affirmation of these truths that have been tested by time. Mm -hmm. We still, we, we still, um, you know, you, you, it's still possible that God might do something new, just like the pen might sometimes fly up. But, um, because that's what happened with the Reformation, and, and, and it can happen. But, um, but I'm always a little bit suspicious about people who discover new truths. Um, it, you know, you'll hear about a book title like, you know, A New Kind of Christian, or, or we're going to reimagine this or something, because... Because I'm always going, well, what is it about today's culture that somehow makes some, somebody think that this is a wonderful vantage point from which to really see truth better? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we live in an age where people get pumped about cat videos. What is it about that <laughs> milieu, that environment that right. really suits us to see with clarity? You know, I don't see it. <laughs> and and so, so I'm going, I get it that we know some things that they didn't know, mm -hmm. but they know some things we didn't know. Um, that that uh, and then there are people who go well yeah but it's not how do you know it's true it's absolute you know unless you're absolute the way I the way I've heard it explained um, by a guy named Paul Hebert um, who wrote a fascinating book called um, what's it called the missiological Imp uh, uh, implications of epistemological foundations. Believe it or not, that was the book title. <laughs> but it's a great book. It's a little thin little book, but a great book. But anyway, he, he said, if you think about a map, when you look at a map, the map is not really telling you the truth, right? Like, like if you looked at a map of Pennsylvania you near know, where I live, there'd be a red square for King of Prussia Mall. But if you went to the King of Prussia Mall, you'd see it's not a red square. Right. The red square is in Moscow. So you go, no, that's not, that's not really there. And if you looked at the Schuylkill Expressway, on the map it's blue, but if you went to the Schuylkill Expressway, it's not blue. If you look at the Pennsylvania Turnpike, it's on the map it's green, but if you go there, it's not green. So that map is not telling us literal truth. On the other hand, it's got to, it's got to correspond to reality. In other words, if I go to the intersection of the Schuylkill Expressway and the Pennsylvania Turnpike and Route 202, if there's not a mall there, then that's not truth, right. and and so the way we the way we think about truth as Christians is we go yeah we realize that when we make these statements about God, that they're you know they're they're kind of approximations you know that 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 just like the road's not green and the mall's not red we're doing the best we can with what we got in fact if if um, you know if the map did give us exact literal information for everything. You couldn't even use the map. Right. There'd be too much information on, which is kind of I think what Jesus was saying. Yeah, there's a lot more I can tell you guys, but you're not ready for it. You know. Um, so, but on the other hand, that map, if it's a good map, it is accurate enough that if you're lost, it can get you back home. That's what the scripture is for us. That's a great metaphor. Is it? It's what I do for a living, dude. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it, it it so it does. It kind of it it yeah. helps us to get back home if we're lost, and that's that. It's true enough for that. So I'm always suspicious. Uh, I think I think we want to be suspicious of the person. All I need is my Bible because every every heresy has been foisted on the church by somebody who just had their Bible, and that's why it's even though we're solo scriptura, solely the scripture, we're also scripture and tradition because tradition is 2,000 years long and a worldwide. Right. So um, all of that's a long answer, but it kind of helps to understand what we mean we say, how do we know this truth is really true? And playing right here, that's, that's why 
Christian community is so important. That's why it's so important. On a macro level and on a micro level too. That's right. That's right. If you, you can't just, so somebody says, well, I just kind of, I just am a Christian by myself. You, you know, you can't, in fact, it's interesting in the, in Ephesians 6, all of the verbs stand and stand therefore and withstand. We'll talk about it next week. All of them are actually plural, plural verbs because Roman soldiers never fought alone because that was certain death. If they huddle together, um, you know, they were almost invincible. You know, they, they, would, uh, they would stand, we'll talk about this more next week, but I mean, the way, the way they postured themselves and positioned themselves, they were, they were almost invincible. But if one of them was by themselves, it was too easy to get outflanked, too easy to beat them. And uh, so, and it's the same for us as Christians. And you're right, that's why Christian community is so, like one, one I have a buddy put it like this, his name is Chris Hall, he said that, he said saving faith, he said, uh, he said that, uh, you know, that we, that we use the scripture alone, but you should never read the Bible alone. Hmm. Because, because it's too easy to have your biases read into the text. Um, I don't know how much time I can tell you, you're getting bored, but there's a little bit, uh, but I'll tell you a story about that. There was this guy, his name was Mark Allen Powell, did an experiment. He didn't mean to be doing an experiment, but he did an experiment with, he was reading this Luke 15 in a seminary class. And he had all the guys get up in, in pairs, and one guy read and the other guy just listened. Then after the thing was over, he said, okay, you guys who are listening, I want you to write down every detail you can remember from the story. So they did that. There were about, a, there were about uh, the first time I did it, there were six. The second time I did the experiment, there were about 100 people. Um, out of the 100, only about 6%, um, only the six of them actually noted in Luke 15 that there was a famine. Most people don't, when they read the story of the prodigal son, they don't notice that there was a famine. So he thought that was interesting that, that 94 out of 100 guys didn't notice the exact same detail. So he tried the same experiment. Later, he was teaching in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And it was just the opposite. Wow. That, that there, um, almost all of them noticed the famine, but almost all of them did not notice that the kid had squandered his money in unwise living. And so he said to the Russian guys, hey, hey you know, do you realize you, you left out the money? They go, and he told them that the American guys, all of them nailed that part. And they go, yeah, that's capitalism for you. you know, that's, for them, that's the worst sin the kid committed was he wow. wasted his money. Where they had, you know, St. Petersburg used to be called Leningrad back in World War II. And went, Leningrad was a 900-day siege by the German army. So 600,000 people starved to death. So when those guys see famine, they notice famine. So he goes, oh, that's interesting. So they did the same experiment. He did it 15 times, bear with me. But no, you did it one more time, but uh, he did the thing again in Tanzania. And there are the guys. He said, so was the, was the young, was the son in a bad spot because of the famine? Or was he in a bad spot because he wasted his money? They said neither one. He was in a bad spot because nobody from that land gave him any help. They noticed a, a section of the text that neither of the other two parties had seen. And of course, a lot of those people have relatives who are living in other countries where they know the trouble of trying to navigate an economy that's not your own. So all that's to say that if I read the text by myself, I am not going to see certain things that I need to see. And if I, and I'm going to see certain things that, you know, that maybe are convenient for me or fit my, that's why, that's why it's so important to have the community. That's great, Duffy. Because truth is, a, is, is communal in yeah. that sense. And hence doing communion today. Yes, that's right. See, Perfect. I knew there was a reason. Yeah, that's, that's right. That makes sense. Duffy, thank you so much. I've got, I'm I've really got, looking. I've got a lot more to talk about. Uh, I, well, Josh is going to go ahead and step in here. <laughs> and I'm going to go to lunch. Okay. I'm just kidding. It, well, it, I can just talk about it after the camera's off. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's watching this anyways. I don't, they, we don't even record these. So. Okay. Uh, but seriously, I'm really looking forward to next Sunday, too. Me, too. Thank yeah, you for thank doing you. this. You bet. Always good to have you. Yep. See everybody next week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. See you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.